Hi everyone, welcome to this uh, second episode of Eta Kappa New Talks. Today we have uh, Rafael Pares, who is co-founder and CEO of Volograms, a startup simplifying volumetric video capture, working on the best way to capture real humans for augmented and virtual reality and other immersive technologies. Volograms is the creator of Volo, the first mobile app that allows you to capture, play and share Volograms simply by using your smartphone. Rafael has more than 10 years of experience in the field of 3D reconstruction, both as an entrepreneur and also as a researcher, and he holds a PhD in computer vision. Many thanks, Rafa, for being here, and I hand it over to you. Thanks a lot for having me. <laughs> Muchas gracias a todos. Uh, I know I'm going to be doing this in English, but uh, it's great to see like so many Spanish names because as, as well, you might not know, but I am Spanish also. <laughs> uh, okay, so let me share my screen very quickly. Uh, again, thanks so much for having me. Uh, thanks, Sasha, and, and everyone else here. I'm going to be telling you about AI Power 3D Humans. Um, uh, I guess my objective with this talk is is to um, tell you what was my story and and uh, a little bit what my company does, Photograms, uh, but also how how it is related to all the research that I've been doing through all throughout all these years, right? How can you can maybe uh, turn an academic re uh, career or a research career into an entrepreneurship career? And you know, all of you are already kind of working and already have some um, industrial experience, which even gives you um, an even better competitive advantage, I guess, in, in this space. So anyway, um, just to, again, uh, introduce a little bit more of myself. Uh, my name is Rafa Pages. Uh, as Sasha said, uh, I did a PhD in computer vision. I studied in uh, uh, in La Politecnica, Uni Universidad Politecnica de Madrid. Um, that's, I, well, first studied uh, uh, telecommunications engineering, and, and then I stayed for a few more years to, to finish my, my PhD there. So I started doing research in 2010. <laughs> so this means it's almost 14 years now of, of uh, experience. Finished my PhD in 2016. Uh, so it's almost like uh, how long? A year almost since I finished my PhD, which only means that I'm old now. Um, but I think that uh, probably the most interesting part is how I ended up building the company, right? So after doing my PhD, I I was looking for a way to continue uh, doing a little bit more research. Um, but at that time, um, the the I was still in Madrid, right? And and the Spanish industry. It didn't look like they were very interested in a PhD in computer vision, where my expertise was mostly on 3D reconstruction. So uh, I know now there's a lot of applications and a lot of uh, companies actually invested in this space, but back then I didn't see it that clear. So I was uh, looking for opportunities somewhere else, you know, like uh, a lot of people probably, some of you might have even done, like uh, moving abroad uh, for some time and, and figure out if you can continue doing your, your research or your career. So I ended up accepting a, a position of postdoc researcher at Trinity College in Dublin. Um, and it was in a very cool lab called Vsense, um, which basically what we were doing was uh, doing a mix between um, AI, 3D reconstruction, image processing algorithms and arts. So we had like a people in the art space uh, coupled with the PhDs and the research in the in the computer vision space. So we had a kind of a, a lot of applications of what we're doing. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that, right? So um, I started saying that we're gonna be talking about AI powered 3D humans. And I'm probably when you're talking, uh, when I'm talking about 3D humans, you're thinking about something like this. <laughs> is this a, a human or, or like a cartoon? Because this is typically the way that um, the way that humans are represented in, let's say in the immersive world. So I don't wanna say the forbidding M word, I'm joking, of course, I'll say it. it's just the metaphors, right? Like how how people are represented typically using avatars. And and this we thought that um, if that, this was the only way of representing a person, then we we're basically doomed because this looks like a, some kind of game. And then these immersive spaces wouldn't be any useful. So what we do with holograms basically is that we power the capture of 3D humans. So um, these are some of the 3D models that we're capturing throughout the years. So you still see some examples here. Um, and we've been doing professional work in, in the arts and performance, as I'll, I'll tell you a little bit later, storytelling, training, corporate communications, marketing, culture, tourism, fashion, social media, and many others like sports that I think I haven't even mentioned. So in general, uh, what we've been focusing on at Fotograms is a way of recording people in 3D, as you see all these 3D models around here. So 
the issue with capturing 3D humans is that typically it's quite expensive and, and complicated, right? So here you have a few examples of uh, different types of uh, 3D capture setups. Uh, some of them are light stages, photogrammetry rigs, the massive volumetric capture studio that Intel built in LA, <laughs> the one that you see on the top right. Um, so typically you need like uh, dozens or even hundreds of cameras in some, in some cases. You need server rooms, you need people to know how to operate and to build these things. Um, and the production time uh, is typically closer to what would be a movie than what probably is like a you know an, an artistic uh, an, an artistic project. So it takes weeks or even months sometimes to get the assets, and the budgets are quite high. So only the very high end productions end up affording something like this. And that's why most of the volumetric capture experiences that we've seen feature typically a famous person or something like that, and they are not really it's not really extended. Um, so this is basically what we were trying to, to fix. Can we can we fix this? Can we solve this, right? Um, but of course, um, the typical thing that they would tell you when you're an entrepreneur is that you have to find a problem and then find a solution to it and make sure that um, you're yeah you're very targeted within your client and so on. But this is not how academia works, right? <laughs> In academia, you typically choose a problem that you think. Uh, it's very difficult to solve, and you go ahead and try to solve it, you know, uh, in a scientific way. And this is basically what we were doing. So, the inspiration that we got when we were working at at Vsense was this shot. <laughs> um, I don't know if you guys uh, remember the Matrix, like this uh, movie. Uh, I think it's still like from the 90s, right? Like, uh, of course, it's uh, iconic, but uh, I re still remember when I saw this this shot for the very first time, right? It was like, how the hell did they do that, right? Um, so on the right, you see how they actually did it. <laughs> so they basically recorded uh, Keanu, uh, Keanu Reeves in this green screen studio. Well, it's all green, basically, like the stands and everything. And they put there more than 100 cameras in doing that path that you see around. So what they faked afterwards was the virtual movement of a camera uh, with the motion frozen. but. Um, the reality is that they capture with all these cameras at the same time and they just faked as if they were going from one camera to the other. So the, the cameras were so close to each other that uh, it really looked like there was one camera moving very fast, but it wasn't really the case. So can we replicate this with a lot fewer cameras? And of course, as we're doing it from a scientific point of view, let's say, with the objective of <laughs> writing a paper, maybe potentially writing a patent, um, what are the, the scenarios? What is the most, most complicated thing that you can think, right? Like first, fewer cameras, that's already there. How, how few, let's say, I don't know, a handful of cameras. Can we do it with cameras that are moving actually, like not even on a tripod, handheld? Can we do this outside of the studio, like um, outdoors, even in crazy conditions, like uh, a rainy day in Dublin? Um, what else, can, can we just, do it with somebody that's moving because here Keanu is basically not moving. It's, it's a couple seconds shot, and but he's just almost frozen. So we put together basically this whole thing, and and ended up building something that looks like this, right? So on the right, you see me doing a, like a little move, and we started like faking the movement of the camera, going from one camera to the next. There was only f uh, six cameras, as you see on the on the example on the on the left. And we were able to fake the movement of the camera without being in the studio, without needing to use uh, green screen outdoors with shiny, <laughs> shiny floors that um, came from the rain and uh, totally uncontrolled scenario. Of course, the level of quality is maybe not as much as what you have in the movie, but the budget <laughs> to do something like this was quite significantly lower. The interesting thing from, um, let's say, scientific point of view is that um, in the in the case of the matrix, they were basically doing image interpolation, just going one image to the next, to the next, to the next. But here the, the cameras are so far apart. And of course they are handheld and of course they are different. They were phones actually in this case. Some of them were portraits, some of them were in landscape. So the, um, the cameras are, are so far apart that we cannot really blend, you know, or make some kind of combination from one camera to the next. So to be able to do that combination or that blending to, to figure out this new camera angles, what we had to build was a 3D reconstruction algorithm that would work with very few little a number of cameras. So in this case, with six cameras. So basically, this, the, the process was 
let's get a 3D representation of the scene and use that 3D representation of the scene to help figure out these new uh, camera angles that we don't have. And uh, the funny thing was that that 3D reconstruction algorithm that we built with only like uh, five, six cameras ended up being quite good. So we ended up patenting it and started creating content in 3D directly without the view interpolation. So we basically abandoned the idea of replicating the matrix and now we were like full 3D. Um, we ended up uh, making it work in different types of scenarios. So the one on the top is a similar one, uh, again, with uh, six cameras, uh, which worked quite well, but as good as so you could actually create like little hologram and play with it in augmented reality. And this was back in 2017 when AR kit for, for, for the iPhone and the iPad was just released. So we were even earlier than that. Uh, so what we did was basically build a little volumetric capture studio, the one that you see on the lower part, the green screen room uh, with 12 cameras only. Instead of uh, 100 cameras, it was only 12. And still with 12 cameras, we were able to get quite good reconstruction as the ones you see here, even fingers, even like facial details, ears and stuff like that. So the quality was actually quite good. And it was 10 times fewer cameras than anything that you will find in the, in the state of the art. Um, so at this point, we were starting to get a lot of, uh, let's say, um, proposals to collaborate with, uh, with industry, but also with academia. So we will get other universities that wanted to try our technology in their different environments. Uh, one of the good things about being in Dublin, I guess, is that um, you get exposed to a lot of the big tech, you know, that uh, Meta or Facebook back in the day, Google, uh, Amazon, Microsoft, they're all there. So all of them got to see this technology very early and many of them started to approach us to do a collaboration with the university. And we saw an opportunity to potentially commercialize it ourselves. So <laughs> we basically did that, created a company and started working on this technology um, to sell it professionally to other studios and to other companies. And this is basically what, what we call the Polygram Studio. This is, we still actually have this solution, but you see it ends up it ended up becoming um, a software only solution. It actually, it's based on the cloud where, that works with totally different camera systems. So these are different examples of camera systems that have used our technology professionally from something as crazy as just five cameras, you know, that like you see in the in the five DSLR temporary studio to capture a head. Uh, to something like uh, 24 smartphones in a in a temporary studio that they just set up in one afternoon and was uh, returned the following day. So something that was totally accessible to very high-end camera setups, like the one that you see on the almost on the right, 84 cameras in a high-end studio, which is actually Samsung Studio. So Samsung is one of the companies that uh, ended up using our technology in their own volumetric capture studio. And of course, we continue developing the technology, right? So we ended up having like extremely advanced camera calibration algorithm that would work with very few little cameras, uh, a few number of cameras, sorry, and and uh, other more interesting things like, for instance, uh, 3D semantic segmentation. You see, you see the 3D model of myself, um, and on the left, you see that we can actually uh, find out semantic labels to different parts of the 3D maps, which is something that typically is done on, in images but uh, not really have, haven't really been used too much on in 3D models. So we do that, we do a markerless 3D motion capture. So we're able to get the skeleton underneath. And, uh, and yeah, so basically we ended up uh, doing all this research, not in the university, but within the company and becoming one of the leaders in the space, one of the companies that uh, would be able to fix almost any volumetric capture system uh where that sometimes it's very complicated you know most of the people end up using very low um camera very low quality cameras or depth sensors and stuff like that that actually you no know, don't work great so our technology has been used in many different types of uh projects see this one for instance is the um so a company in london used it for uh, an installation that they did in the national gallery in london so you see these uh, two actors dressed up as a, as a monk and as a priest. So there was like a, a virtual reality representation of a, of a painting. And then they would basically, you would witness a little bit of the historical context of the painting. That was actually, this is one of my favorites. It was like around 10 minutes. And, and uh, I remember like one of our, one of my colleagues went to London 
uh, for a personal trip and decided to just go there and see it because we hadn't we had a demo but we hadn't really see it in in person at the National Gallery and the the line was so long that he he just couldn't do it so took a little bit of pride in there. <laughs> Um, we've done things like, for instance, this for the, uh, the London Fashion Week. So with the Fashion Innovation, Innovation Agency also in London. So in this case, we captured this fashion model in different outfits and in different conditions. And then there was like this um, immersive experience where you could become uh, the photographer yourself. So you can choose like uh, the surroundings, the lighting, uh, even the, the type of camera that you would use to shoot. And then you could choose from where to shoot it. It was a very cool immersive experience, uh, also kind of educational, so you can learn more or less how a, a photo shoot is done, uh, which, which, was, which was very cool. And we've done other things like, for instance, this one, this is um, uh, a project that we did for uh, basically um, educating women to get into, into science. Uh, so we captured in 3D a couple of a very famous Irish scientists, female scientists, and then there was a little tour that was taken to schools uh, all over the country where they were seeing a, an augmented reality application with these uh, pioneers, right? So they were showing the technology, augmented reality, and volumetric video to um, basically uh, inspire uh, young women to end up choosing this type of careers. But of course, we've done so much more, right? Like uh, these are just some examples. We've gone from uh, theater plays to uh, immersive on location like this one in Trinity College Library. Uh, we've done, we've worked with celebrities like this Dita Bontis. We've also worked, for instance, with Mario Aguerizo. <laughs> for you and all of you know who he is. Probably Sasha doesn't know who he is. I'm not sure. Um, and we've done other things like this. Uh, this one in the bottom is, is an opera. Um, this is an immersive uh, experience uh, done from a German company. Um, I don't know. There's plenty of, uh, of experiences and applications. I also really like this one, which is a holographic presenter. So you see that uh, somebody's looking at here where the, the holographic presenter is, and he's seeing it through the big screen, so the people in the audience could see him. But in general, this is the best solution to um, basically record somebody in 3D, so it's photorealistic, and then you can feel like there's really somebody in front of you and not an, an avatar or, uh, or or just some kind, kind of cartoon, right? So um, this is what we were doing, and uh, we were actually project progressing quite a lot with the company. Um, but the the licensing model that we have was that we were charging per use. So if if you have, um, uh, uh, let's say, a project that requires ten minutes of volumetric capture, we would charge you a certain quantity based on the processing needs that you would require. Uh, but if you were not doing any captures, we were not charging you. So it was basically like a let's say credits for uh, type of system. But uh, if you remember, in 2020, there was something that happened, which was COVID. <laughs> so suddenly, um, there was no captures in almost a year. Like, everyone was at home. Um, nobody wanted to really go to a closed studio anywhere in the world. And uh, we realized that we couldn't really stay with our arms crossed, crossed uh, waiting for uh, COVID to finish. And we had no idea if it was ever going to finish. And, and we actually lost a few opportunities of people that wanted to set up their own volumetric capture studio and now they were not so sure right so we decided to actually go back to the beginning if you remember um the very first demo that i just showed you when we were still at trinity was something that was working with six phones right so we said okay can we turn that little demo that little research project that we had done and make it a commercial product right like you probably are thinking okay it will have to be like an application um, that synchronizes a few phones and you will be like from different angles, then collect all the videos from all the phones, put them to the cloud somehow and get the reconstruction done, right? Um, but at this point, um, the let's say the 3D space had developed quite a lot. We were working on a lot of uh, deep learning um, research internally in the company and there was also a few other products and a few other um, uh, papers that were released that were starting to tackle the single view 3D reconstruction technology. So we have built this whole pipeline with all kinds of um, uh, subsystems, let's say uh, algorithms that we could plug, but the 3D reconstruction was still multi-view. Could we just swap the 3D reconstruction algorithm for a monocular uh, 3D reconstruction algorithm? Something that would work with one single image or one single video taken from one single angle. And this is basically what we did. So we built uh, the solution, um, 
and then we put it into an app called Polio, uh, which is what uh, we were introducing at the very beginning, uh, which basically allows you to record somebody with your smartphone and it doesn't matter where you are. So you see these examples here, uh, all these 3D models that you see in the scene, uh, including this one of myself, were uh, acquired using only the image that you see on top. So um, some of them are more or less in control environments, like these two ladies here that are kind of in a living room with a very pretty standard background. But there are others that are, this one is outdoors, and this one is outdoors too. These two are in an office with all kinds of glass and reflections and stuff like that. So the system would work even in situations that are quite complicated. And, and this was basically taking the, this problem that we had defined at the very early and the very beginning and went all the way to let's make it affordable and accessible to basically anyone. And this is what we did, right? So I'll tell you a little bit more about the technology. So um, we did this, hey, this is uh, Mario Acarito. <laughs> so we did this basically because we thought that um, all of us had at some point become um, creators in some way or another, right? So we are all video creators or photo creators. Now you can take a photo on your phone and then edit the photo. You can publish it and distribute it. You can even charge for it if you want to. And same with video, right? So if we wanted really to, to create a new creator economy and, and explore this opportunity and expand this new market of 3D, we needed to have tools that were as simple uh, as just taking a photo or taking a video, right? And and right now, if you want to create 3D content, or at that point, you had to be, uh, let's say, an artist or a 3D designer or a developer or something like that. It, it was not as simple as just taking a photo. And we thought that we could change that, right? So let me show you how it works, the technology. So that's a little video. Here you have, uh, I'm just gonna stop it all over the way. This is, a, as you see, a, a photo, sorry, a video taken from one single angle. There's only one single camera. Uh, been uh, shooting at, at this lady. So at each frame of the video, of course, I <laughs> clicked the wrong button. So I, we would separate the video into different frames. And for each frame of the video, we would apply a few uh, deep learning algorithms, like for instance, uh, semantic segmentation, we would do normal estimation, and we would generate a full 3D model for each frame. So then we can texture it, and then you can do things like change the lighting, calculate a skeleton underneath, and in general, basically create a 3D asset, a little hologram, just using your smartphone. So there's no need anymore for any um, professional studio. There's no need for any kinds of tools or anything like this. So you can create very easily augmented reality application without uh, being a developer or anything like that. And we made this free. <laughs> so now you can actually download this application if you want to give it a try. It will allow you to do five second captures um, and then, of course, if you're interested in using it for more professional stuff and do like 30 seconds, one minute, that's how we monetize. We charge you for that. And we also offer you like a, a streaming and hosting of the content online in case you want to run your own campaign or your own application. So as you guys are interested in the R&D part of it, <laughs> I'll tell you a little bit more about what we do. Right. So you have this lady again from one single angle, one single camera, as you see over here. We're able to generate this full photorealistic 3D model of her. That's a full 3D model, as you can see. We are even able to get the back, how she looks from behind without being able to capture it. So this includes like a semantic segmentation, as you see over here. This includes uh, normal uh, surface normal estimation that we use using um, uh, image encoders. Again, uh, this is a, uh, as I said, the, how we how she looks from behind. We also able to get the 3D skeleton. So all of these are different neural networks that are applied uh, to the 2D image. And then we put together all this information and generate a 3D model out of that, a volumetric full 3D model. And actually, some of the cool things that we've been doing uh, during the last year and a half with all the <laughs> um, basically popularization of generative AI is, OK, now we have this, semant this semantic label. So what we can do is say, you use the same 3D model, you keep the face, but right now, give me for the rest of the body, give me, I don't know, a body that looks like Wonder Woman or like a police woman or like a doctor or anything like that. And we can generate different texture atlases preserving the face. You could even actually do it the other way around too. You capture somebody in a, let's say, a uniform, say it's a military uniform or something like that. And then you want to generate 100 different faces. <laughs> so with one single capture, you can now generate a bunch of assets and they will all have the same the same uniform in this case. So it's basically expanding uh, the creative possibilities of, 
the technology and making it as affordable and as, as accessible as possible. So you're probably thinking, how are you training this? <laughs> and of course, we train it with all the data that we've been capturing throughout the years in our studio. So we have a data set of more than 60,000 3D models. So we, as you can imagine, uh, training uh, an image classifier or something like that requires a lot of images from the internet and things like this, but it's quite easy to find a lot of images. It's not that simple to find a huge database, database of high quality 3D models. So we got this advantage of having worked with this technology for a few years before, and uh, we were able to get our models, uh, use them for training, we could even label them, use the semantic segmentation that I was showing you at the beginning, also as, a, as an input for our 3D reconstruction algorithms. And yeah, so we've got a lot of people using it, all kinds of brands for all kinds of applications from uh, digital presence in the metaverse. So we integrate with a couple of uh, metaverse platforms like Bitday, that's actually from HTC. Um, we also have worked with uh, some fashion brands like Hugo Boss. Hugo Boss was actually the first one using it. So they captured the whole collection in 3D using our application uh, with all kinds of marketing and, and, and communications from introducing a new event, a new product, a new podcast. Uh, we've done collaborations with also like big brick brands like uh, could be Orange or Vodafone, uh, but also like Mars chocolates. Um, and some of my favorites are like events activations like this one here in the bottom where you see you can take a hologram of yourself with just one single phone. No need to set up like a full volumetric capture in the space. All these are the ones that you see right on top. So this is actually virtual production. Um, so you see nowadays in um, like uh, the TV sets, you get a lot of um, 3D content overlaid with the environment, right? If it's a little bit advanced, it would be also tracked with the camera position. So the camera would be moving and the objects will be fixed in the space, right? Some kind of AR, but for a, for a, for a set, for a TV set. So what some, some places are doing is also putting their like a flat version of a football player or of a rugby player. In this, in this case, these two ladies are actually from um, Gaelic football and in, in Ireland. So the RTE is the public television over there. So they sent us a few photos, including this one that you can see is actually in the, in the stadium. So it's not captured in any controlled environment. And we were able to put together a 3D representation of them. So now you can actually move the camera around, you can put it high or whatever, and uh, they look like they are just there in, in the studio. So you can use it for all kinds of augmented reality graphics. And even though in this example, they haven't really taken advantage of it too much, you can change the lighting, you can ask, have them to cast a shadow, get reflections in a very, very immersive way. So it's actually a very easy tool to use. It only takes a few seconds for every image that you do. So it's a, it's a great thing. And, and this is a, another example. I don't know if there's any Madridistas in the room, but uh, this is a Alfredo Di Stefano. Uh, it's a legend from Real Madrid who passed away many years ago. But you see that this also works with photos from the past. So this is a photo from when he was young, playing in Real Madrid, like in the in the fifties or in the sixties. So you can take basically any photo and turn it into three D. There's not really a need to do it with with the app or anything. It just works with any other any image. So I'm almost done now. So <laughs> in general, what we're trying to build is the the most powerful powerful three D AI platform. So basically, something that fuels. Uh, what we believe is a new medium, right? Uh, call it the metaverse, call it spatial computing, or call it whatever you want. But in general, it's a it's a new generation of content that is 3D, that is immersive, and that um, is going to change the way with, that we communicate. So we think that there's a new communications paradigm, and and the good thing, as we were discussing at the very beginning, is that um, there's plenty of opportunities right now, plenty of areas that need to be explored that go from you know, image classifiers to 3D model generation to 3D model classifiers to, um, I don't know, all kinds of generative AI craziness. And, and of course, uh, everything that goes around it, like encoding, like uh, streaming, like, uh, I don't know, in general, I, I can think of the telecommunications implications as I am a telecommunications engineer, but uh, I'm sure that you guys could see also all kinds of applications in this space. So, that's it for me. Uh, hope it wasn't too boring. <laughs> so please ask any questions that you might have. I'm happy to answer either in English or Spanish, although I think uh, for the sake of uh, having uh, having it published, it's probably better to do it in English, uh, but I'll leave it up to you. So yeah, many thanks Rafa, for this presentation. So it's 
very interesting. I mean, I work also in the field. I might be a bit biased here, um, <laughs> but it's also amazing for me to see. I mean, you said that this was met well, many years ago uh, before all these foundation models, before all this generative AI hype, before uh, all the stuff we see now every day. And you guys had this already <laughs> back then. This is uh, kind of amazing to see for me. Thank you very um, much. It is true that uh, that sometimes it feels like AI was invented like a year and a half ago, you know, and <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, we've been working with these type of things like uh, for many years before. And and, uh, and I think that's very interesting. It gives us like a privileged uh, view of the whole space. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I actually have a question, but it's more related, I think, on the entrepreneur partnership side because i mean what you showcased very good in this example was the one aspect is the phd side and the other one is then the application and becoming an entrepreneur and i think as a phd student you're overthinking probably it too much you're so focused on the technical aspects mm -hmm. and you might anticipate already that this is not going to work so how was this for you because I'm always thinking if someone proposed me something, I have 10 ideas why this could be difficult. So how was this for you to overcome this? Uh, um, yeah, I, I think I have a really good answer for this is that even though I did a PhD and I, I went, the, let's say the straightforward way uh, to finish your degree and then you go and do your master and then you go and do your PhD. My, well, I was a few years into my PhD, I already was quite sure that I was a pretty bad scientist, you know, <laughs> in the sense that um, I was always more interested in uh, making it work and making sure that somebody could actually use it and they would help someone than actually into being like 10% better than the state of the art. So, so the, the part uh, where I had to, because back in that, uh, when I was doing my PhD, it was not so common that people would make their code available. We didn't have hugging face or, or any platform to just run it. If, I think even Docker's were quite rare um, but at that time. So it was very complicated to replicate somebody else's code. You may, you may dedicate like a couple of months just to maybe re-implement something or maybe just make somebody else's code work in your environment so you can compare yourself. I just hated all of that. <laughs> so for me, it was very clear that if I could build something that would be useful for someone, that could be an artist, like for instance, what, um, what we were mostly focusing uh, at Vsense, right, at Trinity College Dublin, like uh, somebody who could create something creative, very cool, pretty impressive, and something that completely blew your head off uh, without having to be like, a, uh, you know, the, the best in the market, the be very best in the best. And the m it was more about being the most original and, you know, breaking barriers and in, in uh, the use of what a technology in a, in a particular field. Um, so that, that was to me a lot more interesting. I think that's why um, I had so much fun working at Trinity because I think we were more encouraged to build something mind blowing. That's something that would be, uh, yeah, 10% better than whatever other paper that was released six months before. You know, it was more about who ends up using it and the use cases that you're building. So I think that's why I was so exciting and, and uh, so excited to become an entrepreneur because it was basically changing completely my way of seeing it from from this to it just has to work you know it has to be robust it has to work outside of the lab environment which is if you guys know uh all kinds of algorithms work great with the data sets that they train them on and then you put them into the real world and they <laughs> stop working so uh we were just focused on making it work more than to be the best the best 